Okay. I will be ready the next time that we play the game. For now, <laughs> it's codex time. You're not going to like this. Well, maybe you will like this. But if you don't like this, just skip ahead, would you? Um, we're going to read the codex. And by read the codex, I mean read the codex. In which case, we're going to read everything from creatures down to quest related. Although we know everything about quest related, which is fortunate. I think controls we won't read just because, eh, I mean, that's boring shit. When I think codex, I think lore behind the game. So let's just click through this shit because that's not relevant. But for notes, uh, characters, books and songs, culture and history, magic and religion, items and creatures, we will read the codex. So, again, this is the beginning of an episode in which nothing will be read, nothing will be done, except for reading the codex. So if you don't want to witness all of this, just skip ahead to the next episode if it's already available, and you won't miss an ounce of gameplay. For those who want to stick around, the codex. Archdemon. In darkness eternal they searched, for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer, the sleeping dragon Dumat. Their taint twisted even the false god, and the whisperer awoke at last in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all nations of the world. The first blight. Trinities 8 7. The false dragon gods of the Deventer Imperium lie buried deep within the earth, where they have been imprisoned since the Maker cast them down. No one knows what it is that drives the darkspawn in the relentless search for the sleeping old gods. Perhaps it is instinct, as moths will fly into torch flames. Perhaps there is some remnant of desire for vengeance upon the ones who goaded the magisters to assault heaven. Whatever the reason, when darkspawn find one of these ancient dragons, it is immediately afflicted by the taint. It awakens twisted and corrupted and leads the darkspawn in full-scale invasion of the land, a blight. So it sounds like the dragons are a, or are the old gods, and the maker is somehow opposed to them. And so the mages of Tevinter Imperium, having invaded the Golden City, turned it into the Black City, being cast back. To the real world as darkspawn it's some kind of punishment from the maker to the old gods that the darkspawn would corrupt them i don't know genlock these are the most common darkspawn in the underground stocky and tough genlocks are notoriously difficult to kill even by magic alphas in any group of genlocks there is usually one who is dominant as the tallest, strongest, and smartest of their kind, alphas serve as a sort of commander, directing or bullying the others in combat. Emissaries, the most intelligent of the alphas, become gifted sorcerers with many abilities akin to blood magic. They use the emissaries, and they usually only appear during a blight. Herlock. Tarda the Truth. Didn't start that very well, did I? Taller than their Genlock cousins, the Herlocks are roughly of a human size, but are possessed of considerable strength and constitution. The shock troop of the Darkspawn, a single berserking Herlock, can often be a match for numerous opponents at once. They are known to adorn themselves with roughly carved tattoos to keep track of their kills and deeds, though it is unknown whether or not there is a uniform standard to these markings. Alphas. Alpha Herlocks are more intelligent and more skilled fighters, often serving as commanders or even generals. Emissaries. Herlock emissaries have also been known to appear during a blight. These darkspawn are the only ones recorded as being capable of human speech and are often capable of employing magic. Mabari Warhound. Dogs are an essential part of Ferelden culture. And no dog is more pies more prized than the than the Mabari. The breed is as old as myth, said to have been bred from the wolves who served Dane. 
Prized for their intelligence and loyalty, these dogs are more than mere weapons and status symbols. The hounds choose their masters and pair with them for life. To be the master of a Mambari is anywhere in Ferelden, in a, uh, of a Mambari anywhere in Ferelden, is to be recognized instantly as a person of worth. The Mambari are an essential part of Ferelden military strategy. Trained hounds can easily pull knights from horseback or break lines of pikemen, and the sight and sound of a wave of war dogs, howling and snarling, has been known to cause a panic even among the most hardened infantry soldiers. Ogres. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Poor Derek. Towering over their darkspawn kin, the massive ogres are a rare sight on the battlefield. Traditionally, they only appear during a blight, but some records claim that ogres have been spotted in the deep roads, hunting alone or in small groups. At least one report by the Grey Wardens claims that an ogre was spotted alone in the Karkori Wilds in 919 Dragon, though it was weakened and easily dispatched. Up to a hundred of these creatures can accompany a darkspawn horde at any one time during a blight, often using their great strength to burst through fortifications and demolish the front lines of the opposing army. They use brute force to charge their enemies like bulls, slam the ground with their fists to shake enemies off their feet, and hurl giant rocks into the face of oncoming foes. Melee can be difficult against a giant that snatches a warrior up in one hand, crushing the life out of him or beating him into oblivion with the other hand. The nimble can try to wiggle his way free, or an ally can attempt to array uh, an array of stunning blows on an orger, ogre to free the comrade in danger. Grey Warden lore urges caution when slaying an ogre. Unless it is ensured that they have received a major wound to the head or the heart, it is possible that they are lying dormant and will regenerate to full health in a matter of minutes. During a blight, most Grey Wardens recommend burning all darkspawn to ashes, dead ogres in particular. Shade. It has often been suggested that the only way for a demon to affect the world of the living is by possessing a living, or once living, body. This is not always true. Indeed, a shade is one such creature, a demon in its true form that has adapted to affect the world around it. My hypothesis is this. I don't know who, whose hypothesis this is, but sure. We already know that many demons become confused when they pass through the veil into our world. They are unable to tell the living from the dead, the very static nature of our universe, is, uh, universe being confusing to a creature that is accustomed to a physicality divined, defined entirely by emotion and memory. Most demons seek to immediately seize upon anything they perceive as life, jealously attempting to possess it. But what of those who do not? What of those that encounter no life or fail to possess a body? What of those that are more cautious by their nature? These demons watch. They lurk. They envy. In time, such a demon will learn to drain energy from the psyche of those it encounters, just as it did in the Fade. Once it has drained enough, it has the power to manifest and will forever be, uh, forever after be known as a shade. Such a creature spurns possession. It instead floats as a shadow across its piece of land, preying upon the psyche of any who cross its path. Perhaps it believes itself still in the Fade? There is evidence to believe this is so. A shade will weaken the living, living uh, by its very proximity. If it focuses its will, it can drain a single target very quickly. Some have even been known to assault the minds of a living victim, causing confusion or horror and making the target ripe for the kill. The tragedy of a shade is perhaps that once it has drained the target whole, its appetite is only heightened rather than slaked. From the journey of former senior enchanter Malleus, once of the Circle of Rivain, declared apostate in 920 Dragon Age. Wolf. It is rather unfair the reputation that the wolf possesses in Ferelden. For a people that so clearly adore their hounds, Ferelden's simultaneously harbor a distrust of wolves that borders on the unreasonable. Unreasonable, that is, if one were not familiar with the ancient legends regarding werewolves. 
There was a time at Ferelden's past when demons inhabited the bodies of wolves in great numbers, causing the wars against werewolves and spreading great, and great fear and panic. The werewolves were slain, but even today, the noble wolf is still looked upon with distrust. From Legends of Ferelden by Mother Aelis of Denerim, 910 Dragon. An attack by wolves upon civilized folk happens rarely, often only in times of desperation, and even then only when the wolves have the, dis uh, the advantage of numbers. This can change during a blight. When darkspawn rise onto the surface, their presence dramatically alters the savage nature of normal beasts. In blights past, as the corruption of the darkspawn spread through the wilder areas of Thedas, would infect the animals round, uh, found there, and the more powerful of them would survive and be transformed into a more vicious and dangerous beast. A blight wolf is one such example, mad with the pain of its infection, and only through the overriding command of the darkspawn does it still retain some semblance of its pack instincts. Blight wolves are always found in large groups, and will tend to overwhelm a single target if they can using their numbers to their advantage. It is fortunate that these creatures rarely survive their corruption for very long. Um, there was something... I, oh, Thetis, right? So, uh, everybody that's played the game, I'm sure, knows this. Thetis is the world of Dragon Age Origins and the ensuing games. But Thetis actually stands for... Uh, the, the word came from what the Bioware employees used as shorthand for the Dragon Age setting. So before the world was named, they just called it the DAS, Dragon Age setting. And at some point, somebody at uh, Bioware decided, hey, Thetis alone, the DAS, is a great name for <laughs> the world that we're creating. So that ended up working out. Good for them, whoever that was. That was creative. I liked it. Havard's Aegis. Havard was Maferath's closest friend. They were children together in the same Avar clan. They fought side by side in so many battles that Maferath dubbed him Havard the Aegis, better to have at his side than any shield. Maferath brought Havard with him to meet with the Tevinters. It was unthinkable to stand before his enemies without his Aegis. When he understood that Maferath was giving Andraste over to be executed, Havard, unwilling to draw swords against his friend and liege, placed himself between Andraste and the Tevinter soldiers. The Tevinter struck him down, and Maferath left him for dead. But Aegis was not so easily destroyed. Havard la lived and made his way, gravely wounded, to the gates of Minthraus. Wait, Minrathus. Minrathus. <laughs> Stop the execution. Too late! He found only the ashes of the prophet, left to the wind and rain. When his fingers touched the ash, his ears filled with song, and he saw a vision of Andraste dressed in cloth of starlight. He knelt at his side, she knelt at his side, saying, Rise, Aegis of the Faith, the Maker shall never forget you, so long as I remember. His wounds healed instantly, and with new strength, Havard gathered up Andraste's remains and carried them safely back to the lands of the Almari. Magic and Religion the Tranquil. The Tranquil are the least understood but most visible members of the Circle. Every city of respectable size boasts a Circle of Magi shop, and every one of these shops is run by a Tranquil proprietor. The name is a misnomer, for they are not Tranquil at all. Rather, they are like inanimate objects that speak. If a table wished to sell you an enchanted penknife, it could pass as one of these people. Their eyes are expressionless, their voices monotone. Incomparable craftsmen they might be, but they are hardly the sort of mages to put ordinary folk at ease. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi. Culture and History. Oh, there's a lot here. Lothering. In ancient times, Lothering was little more than a trading post that served the fortress of Ostagar to the south. Nowadays, it is larger, serving Red Cliff and the community of merchants and surface dwarves near Orzammar. 
Its location on the North Road gives it strategic value, so control of Noldering has historically been a matter of contention between the Southern Bannorn and the South Reach Arling. King Kaladin had himself stepped in and awarded the town to South Reach in the Exalted Age, which has largely ended the feud, or at least the appearance of it. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi. The Castless. The caste system in Orzammar includes many groups of privilege, the nobility and the warriors above all others, but to a lesser degree the merchants and the smiths and the miners. Tradition establishes a clear hierarchy, but as in any culture with an upper class, there is also a clear underclass. These unfortunates, the so-called castless, are believed to be descendants of criminals and other undesirables. They have been looked down upon since Orzammar's foundation. They have taken up residence in a place called Dust Town, a crumbling ruin on the fringe of Orzammar's common areas. Orzammar society considers these castless lower than even the servant caste. Indeed, the castless are not allowed to become servants, as it is too honorable a position. They are seen as little better than animals, their faces branded at birth to mark them as the bastard children of the kingdom. Their home district, little more than a slum, is a haven for crime, organized and otherwise. Orzammar's guards seemingly cannot be bothered to patrol its streets. The best that most caseless dwarves can hope, dwarves can hope for is a life at the whim of a local crime lord, ended abruptly by violence, or an overabundance of toxic lichen ale. Even so, there is some hope for the castless, a dangling rope that offers a way up into a greater Orzammar society. Since a dwarf's caste is determined by the parent of the same sex, the male child of a nobleman is part of that noble's house and caste. Strangely, it is acceptable for castless women to train in the arts of courtly romance to woo nobles and warriors. They are known as noble hunters. Any male born from such a union is considered a joyous event, considering the low rate of dwarven fertility. The mother and entire family are then taken in by the father's house, although they retain their caste. The dwarves we know on the surface are also considered castless once they leave Orzammar, although this is only relevant to those who return, if they are allowed to return at all. Dwarves who leave for the surface, the sun touched, as they're often called behind their backs, lose their connection to the stone in the favor of their ancestors, and thus are worthy of little more than pity, for upon dying they are said to be lost to the stone forever. Put that way, it seems a sad existence indeed. From Stone Halls of the Dwarves by Brother Genetivi, Chantry Scholar. City of Orzammar. The dwarves are lauded for their craftsmanship, and the city of Orzammar is one of their finest works. Orzammar lies at the heart of the Frostback Mountains, deep underground. The city arcs outward from the royal palace, which is built around a natural lava event, continually fountaining liquid rock, which both lights and heats the entire cavern. The topmost tier of Arzamar, it, Orzammar is home to the noble caste, with their palaces fanning out in both directions from the court of the king, as well as the chaparit, which serves as a repository for all dwarven knowledge. The lower tier is the commons, where the merchants, uh, merchant castes holds merchant caste holds sway, and where the finest works of Orzammar's craft, craftsmen are for sale. In the center of the river of lava. Connected to the commons by a causeway are the Proving Grounds, a sacred arena where the dwarves, by ancient tradition, settle their disputes. On one side of the fiery river are the ruins of old dwarven palaces, fallen into disrepair, which the locals call Dust Town, now home to the city's castless. On the other side of the river are the deep roads, which once joined the sprawling dwarven empire together, but now, after centuries of dark spawn incursions, are largely sealed off. Nearly all knowledge of this network of underground passages has been lost, even to its builders. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi. Take a drink here real quick. The Proving. Balus Atreidum. In the 23rd year of the reign of King Ragnan Adukin, an old man of the servant caste, was accustomed to, uh, of stealing a sapphire, sapphire ring from his employer, Lord Dace. 
The servant was stripped of his position, he and his family thrown to the streets, and soon afterward the servant died. The son of the disgraced servant challenged Lord Daystrew, approving, declaring that his father had been the victim of a cruel injustice and that the ancestors could, would bear him witness. Lord Dace had no choice but to accept. On the sacred stone of the proving ground, the nobleman faced the servant boy. Lord Dace carried a sword crafted for his own hand and was clad in his great-grandfather's armor. The servant boy had neither armor nor weapon. When the battle began, the boy fought like a whole pack of angry deep stalkers, flinging himself upon the startled lord, wrenching the sword from his hand, and prying at his armor with bare fingers. The boy locked, knocked Lord Dace to the ground and beat him until the lord begged for mercy. The boy and his family were reinstated to their place in the Dace household, and the virtue of the boy's father was not questioned again. The ancestors had spoken, and no one would question their word, as told by a shaper of Ortag. Ostagar. Representing the furthest point of encroachment by the ancient Avinter Imperium into the barbarian lands of the southeast, the fortress of Ostagar was once one of the most important defensive holdings south of the Waking Sea. It stood at the edge of the Karkari Wilds, watching for any signs of invasion by the barbarians known today as the Chastened Wilders. Straddling a narrow pass in the hills, the fortress needed to be bypassed to reach the fertile lowlands of the north and proved to be exceedingly difficult for the wilders to attack because of its naturally defensible position. Like most imperial holdings in the south, Ostagar was abandoned after Tavinch's collapse during the First Blight. It was successfully sacked by the Chasen Wilders and then, as the Chasen threat dwindled following the creation of the modern Ferelden nation, fell to ruin completely. It has remained unmanned for four centuries, though most of the walls still stand, as does the tall Tower of Ishal, named after the great Archon that ordered its construction. Ostagar remains a treat, uh, testament to the magical power of the Imperium that created it. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. The Grey Wardens. The first blight had already raged for 90 years. The world was in chaos. A god had risen, twisted and corrupted. The remaining gods of Tevinter were silent, withdrawn. What writing we have recovered from those times is filled with despair for everyone, believed, from the greatest archons to the lowest slaves, lowliest slaves, that the world was coming to an end. At Weishaupt Fortress in the desolate Anderfels, a meeting transpired. Soldiers of the Imperium, seasoned veterans who had known nothing their entire lifetimes except hopeless war, came together. When they left Weishaupt, they had renounced their oaths to the Imperium. They were soldiers no longer. They were the Grey Wardens. The Wardens began an aggressive campaign against the Blight, striking back against the Darkspawn, reclaiming lands given up for lost. The Blight was far from over, but their victories brought notice and soon they received aid from every nation in Thetis. They grew in number as well as reputation. Finally, in the year 992 of the Tevinter Imperium, upon the Silent Plains, they met the archdemon Dumat in battle. A third of all the armies of northern Thetis were lost to the fighting, but Dumat fell, and the Darkspawn fled back underground. Even that was not the end. The Imperium once revered seven gods, Dumat, Zazakel, Toph, Andorel, Razakala, and Lusakon, and Urthemiel. Four have risen as archdemons. The Grey Warden have kept watch through the ages, well aware that peace is fleeting and that their war continues until the last of the dragon gods is gone. Okay, so we've had four out of seven. So presumably this is the fifth, and there are two others? Good grief. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. The Korkari Wilds. It is said that in the midst of the Black Age, when werewolves stalked the lands of Ferelden in numbers that kept every farmholder indoors and a hound on every doorstep, a powerful Arl of the Almari peoples stood and declared that he would put an end to the threat. His Arling stood on the border of the Dark Forest and the southern border of the Ferelden Valley and he claimed that the werewolves used the forest to launch their midnight assaults on humanity. 
For 20 years, this Arl led an army of warriors and hounds deep into the forest. In his hunt for the werewolves, he slew not only every wolf he came upon, but also every member of the Chasen Wilder folk. Any one of them, he said, could harbor a demon inside, and thus be a werewolf in disguise. For 20 years, the forest rang with screams, and the rivers ran red. The tales say that an old chastened woman found her sons all dead at the Arl's blades. She pulled one of those very blades from one son's heart and plunged it into her own chest, cursing the Arl's name as she did so. Where her blood touched the ground, a mist began to rise. It spread and spread until it was everywhere in the forest. The Arl's army became lost, and it is said that they died there. Others say they wander still. The ruins of his Arling stand to this day, filled with the ghosts of women waiting eternally for their husbands to return. The forest of legend is, of course, the Korkari Wilds. There are as many legends about the great southern forest as there are shadows, or so the saying goes. The chastened wilder folk have made their home there since mankind first came to these lands, and the wildlands spread as far into the south as anyone has ventured. Beyond the mists are vast tracts of snow, white-capped mountains, and entire fields of ice. It is land too cold for mankind to survive, yet the chastened eke out an existence even there, and they tell of horrors beyond the wilds the lowland folk could not begin to comprehend. To most, Ferelden simply ends with the Korkari wilds. There is nothing beyond the wilds. Is it land? There's nothing beyond. Oh, there's nothing beyond. The wilds is a land of great trees, wet marshes, and dangerous monsters. What more need be said? From Land of the Wilders by Mother Aelis, Chantry Scholar, 918, Dragon. Darkspawn. The surfacers claim that the first Darkspawn fell from heaven. They spin tales of magic and sin, but the children of the stone know better. Darkspawn rose up out of the earth. For it was in the deep roads they first appeared, creatures in our own likeness, armed and armored, but with no more intelligence than Tezpadam, bestial and savage. At first they were few, easily hunted and slain by our warriors, but in the recesses of the deep roads they grew in number and in courage. Our distant thags came under attack, and now it was the army, not a few warriors, being sent to deal with the creatures. Victory still came evilly, easily, though, and we thought the threat would soon be over. We were wrong, as told by Shaper Sibor. The Blights. My dear Annika, I would not worry about the assembly. Let the nobles sit together and argue over whose house owns the grandest thag. It keeps them from panicking, which they would surely do otherwise, and prevents them from making a greater nuisance of themselves. War is the business of warriors. I would say that the enemy's strategy seems to be changing, but they never appeared to have a strategy before, beyond destroying everything in their path. For weeks, their numbers appeared to be dwindling. There was talk that perhaps we were getting close to wiping them out. We could not have been more wrong, for today we came upon the body of their main force. I cannot give words to it, Anika. I have never before seen so much death in one place. There were darkspawn beyond counting. And at the heart of the throng, a great beast, as tall as the palace of Orzammar, with breath of fire. A paragon of darkspawn, perhaps, for they seemed to pay it deference. They were leaving, marching toward the mine shafts which lead to the surface. But I knew when I beheld them that once they had devoured what lies above, they will be back. From the letters of Paragon and Dugan. Okay, that's a little discouraging to uh, Georgian's idea that, hey, you know what, if we got back to Orzammar, maybe the Darkspawn would never be able to touch me there. Because it sounds like, at least according to Paragon Adukin, once they've devoured the surface, they will devour the underground. Characters. My god. Alistair. You know one good thing about the Blythe is how it brings people together. Alistair was a novice Templar when Duncan recruited him into the Grey Wardens, or rescued him, as Alistair would say. His mother was a serving girl who died when Alistair was very young. He was raised by Eamon Garin, Arl of Redcliffe, for a time. Well, he didn't tell us that he was raised by Arl Eamon, that's interesting. 
Queen Enora. We have been given the gift of freedom by our forebearers. Let us not, not squander it. The only child of the war hero Loghain McTeer, Enora has never been one to stay quietly in the background. It is common knowledge that in the five years Enora and Kaelin held the throne together, she was one. She was the one wielding the power. She is held in much higher esteem than her husband by the people of Ferelden, nobility and commoners alike, and commands the respect even of foreign nations. Having once inspired Empress Selene of Orlais to declare, Anora of Ferelden is a solitary rose among brambles. King Caelan Theron. I'd hoped for a war like in the tales, a king riding with the fabled Grey Wardens against a tainted god. Son of the legendary King Merrick Theron, Caelan was the first Ferelden king born into a land free from foreign rule in two generations. Since his father's death, he's held the throne alongside his queen, Anora. He fell in battle alongside Duncan and Ostigar. Sir Cothrian. Some of us know what honor and loyalty are. Cothrian came to Loghain's service the hard way. She belonged to a poor family and was out doing work on the farm when she saw a man on horseback being attacked by several bandits. She rushed to, his, rushed to his assistance and found out belatedly that the man she saved was none other than the great hero Loghain. Though she was hardly more than a child, she took her, he took her in, offering her a position with his soldiers, and she climbed through the ranks through sheer determination, becoming the commander of Merrick's shield. Loghain's elite soldiers was the proudest moment of her life. Duke! The Mabari is clever enough to speak and wise enough to know not to. Ferelden proverb. Georgian found this Mabari in the camp at Ostigar. His master was killed in the wilds, and Duke fell ill from biting the dark spawn in battle. Duke seems to have chosen Georgian as his new master now, seeking Georgian out after the Battle of Ostigar, and warning of an impending dark spawn attack. Duncan. Men and women from every race, warriors and mages, barbarians and kings. Grey Wardens sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness, and prevailed. Like many others, Duncan gave up his family name when he joined the ranks of the Wardens, a symbolic gesture of cutting ties. He might say this was a convenience in his case, however. His mother was from the Anderfells, his father from Tevinter. His childhood was spent in the Free Marches in Orlais. His people were everywhere, and his homeland was nowhere. He was given the almost impossible task of leading the Wardens in Ferelden, a kingdom that had thrown the order out 200 years earlier. Facing local suspicion and hostility, he set about finding, uh, finding recruits. He was killed in battle against overwhelming numbers of Darkspawn and Ostagar, alongside King Caelan. Arl Eamon Garen Nobility does not exist without obligations. We owe all we have, even our lives, to our land and our people. As the maternal uncle of King Caelan, Arl Eamon is one of the king's most trusted advisors. Redcliffe, while not a large or especially wealthy part of Ferelden, is a critical strategic location. The fortress guards the western pass that leads to Arlais, as well as the major trade route with Orzammar. A well-respected man, though not the most charismatic, King Caelan once said of him, My uncle Eamon is a man everyone thinks well of, when they remember to think of him at all. Flemeth, you are required to do nothing, least of all believe. Ages ago, legend says Ban Conobar took to wife a beautiful young woman who harbored a secret talent for magic, Flemeth of High Ever. And for a time, they lived happily, until the arrival of a young poet, Osin, who captured the lady's heart with his verse. They turned to the chastened tribes for help and hid from Conobar's wrath in the wilds until word came to them that Conobar lay dying. His last wish was to see Flemeth's face one final time. The lovers returned, but it was a trap. Conobar killed Osun and imprisoned Flemeth in the highest tower of the castle. In grief and rage, Flemeth worked a spell to summon a spirit into this world to wreak vengeance upon her husband. Vengeance she received, but not as she planned. The spirit took possession of her, turning Flemeth into an abomination. Twisted, maddened creature, she slaughtered Conobar and all his men and fled back into the wilds. 
For a hundred years, Flemeth plotted, stealing men from the Chasen to sire monstrous daughters. Horrific things that could kill a man with fear. These Kokari witches led an army of Chasen from the wilds to strike at the Alamari tribes. They were defeated by the hero Cormac, and all the witches burned, so they say. But even now the wilders whisper that Flemeth lives on in the marsh, and she and her daughters seal those men who come too near. Morgan's mother saved the last of the Grey Wardens from death at the top of the Tower of Vishal. But just who or what Flemeth truly is, is a mystery. Logan McTeer. It takes more than legends to win a battle. Oh, he gets a second quote, apparently. Understand this, I will brook no threat to this nation from you or anyone. Logan was born a farmer during a time when his country was under foreign occupation by the Orlesians, I presume. When he was still a boy, he joined the Resistance, where his considerable tactical genius quickly became apparent. He became, became close friends with Prince Merrick, the last true heir to the Ferelden throne, and together they led the rebels to drive out the forces of the Orlesian Empire. Merrick raised his friend to the nobility, and Loghain is now more of a symbol uh, uh, than a man. He represents the Ferelden ideals of hard work and independence. During the Battle of Ostagar, he fled the field, leaving King Caelan and Grey Wardens to die. He then returned to Denerim and declared himself the regent to his daughter, Queen Anora, demanding that Ferelden follow him against the Darkspawn, upsetting a great many of the bands. Ban, I presume, is equivalent to Baron. Arl, I presume, is equivalent to Earl. I think that's what we're going for here. Morrigan. Which of the wilds, such idle fancies, those legends, have you no minds of your own? Of, her so of herself, Morgan says little. She does not deny being a witch of the wilds, but beyond that, everything about her is in question. Her mother claims to be Flemeth. If that's true, the Morgan, the Morgan might be a very powerful witch, for the tales of the daughters of Flemeth tell of twisted, monstrous women who can kill a man with fear. She was made to accompany the surviving, surviving Grey Wardens, a payment, Flemeth said, for saving their lives at the Tower of Ishal. Ban Tegan Garen. The Banorn will not bow to you simply because you demand it. Younger brother to Arl Eamon of Redcliffe, and uncle to King Caelan, Tegan holds the banner Banorn of Ransphere, a tiny province of Redcliffe's Red Cliffs, squeezed between the Frostback Mountains and Lake Callanhead. Ban Tegan avoids the Denerim court, except to go hunting with his nephew, and rarely makes himself heard at the landsmeet, preferring to leave politics to his brother. Presume Denerim is the capital? Sounds like. Win, who we met very briefly. I will not lie motionless in a bed with coverlets up to my chin, waiting for death to claim me. Wynne's talent became apparent early on, particularly her skill at healing magic. She was well-liked by all her mentors, and was recognized as an exceptionally gifted student. Even the Templars who watched her could not deny that she represented the best the Circle had to offer. She was an intelligent young woman who possessed a quiet confidence and maturity beyond her years. Okay, I, I want to say when we met her, she was in the Chantry. But here it's talking about her from the Templar's point of view, saying she was the best the Circle had to offer. She spent many years mentoring apprentices within the Circle, and her peers thought so highly of her that she was asked to be the first Enchanter Irving's successor. She refused, saying that she had no desire to work in the upper echelons. When word reached the tower of King Caelan's call to arms, Wynne volunteered to go to Ostagar. It Interesting. That's different than we were expecting. Uh, more information on wind that was surprising, I think, than anything else. Okay, just the notes now, of which there are three or twenty-eight. A note from Sir Henrik. So many of my fellow knights have been searching for the urn. Surely one of them must have found Brother Chenetivi by now. Still, until I hear that all is well, I must proceed as planned. Brother Genitivi holds the key to finding the urn of sacred ashes. We always knew this, but I believe I now know where Brother Genitivi lies. 
I have been to his home in Denerim and found the trail, and I am amazed that other knights have not done likewise, unless they have. No, it is best not to get caught up in the thoughts of conspiracy. Sir Donal awaits my report in Lothering. I must go to him immediately and report what I have learned. Should anyone find these ramblings, all I ask is that he be informed of my fate. I pray that he complete what I cannot. Note from Sir Henrik of Redcliffe. Urn of Sacred Ashes, we know nothing about. Brother Genitivi, we know that he's written some of these entries, but we don't know anything about him apart from that. Feast Day Gifts, credits. That's just the credits of uh, the Feast Day Gifts DLC, I presume. Feast Day Pranks, similar. All right. Hey. <laughs> that shortens our reading time a bit. Thank you. Wow, look at all this. Oh, my God. Okay. All right, everybody. Lothering. We will explore the next time that we play. Until then, thanks very much for watching. Uh, thanks for sticking through the uh, Codex episode. And until then, I will see you around.